I'm going to go over just briefly here, um, or as brief as I can at least, uh, the Roaring Twenties, which is chapter 23 of the AMSCO textbook. Um, the, it's not even a decade. I mean, yes, the 1920s is a decade, uh, but in terms of its roar, um, it's not even a decade. Uh, as the end of my last lecture pointed out, 1921, there's a economic slump, and the stock market crashes 1929, so it's not even a full 10 years. Uh, moreover, the um, very limited in terms of who um, actually was enjoying this time period. Um, rural folks do not see the advantages of the time period. Um, people of color don't see the advantages. It's largely urban, uh, upper middle class and upper upper class folks that, um, that are, are, are uh, feeling the advantages of the time period. Um, so let's look at this period and see what's going on here. Um, as you remember, the last uh, lecture was about the progressive era. Um, um, unfortunately, high-minded ideals and um, uh, ethical solutions to political problems don't win the day over the ability to make money. Um, and uh, the laissez-faire policies of the period ultimately went out um, with uh, a series of um, uh, hands-off laissez-faire uh, presidents. Obviously, again, to, rem to remind us, when I say hands-off, it means hands-off in uh, uh, to help labor. So labor and workers don't get a, uh, a hands-on approach, but with respect to uh, big business and industry, uh, the government is very hands-on with uh, tariffs and uh, strike-breaking uh, and legislating, uh, or lack of legislation to uh, lower the workday or um, uh, workers' rights, child labor laws, things like that. Uh, so Harding is the first, there you see him. Coolidge is the second, and Hoover is the last. That's a Hoover vacuum. Uh, the, the joke is always that Hoover, uh, Hoover sucks. Um, Harding, Coolidge, Hoover, uh, one-termers, all basically the same guy. Uh, uh, laissez-faire policies. Uh, they have very, dis you know, there's little distinctions between them, but we don't need to make much of them. Um, uh, they're all Republicans. Uh, the progressive Republicans, remember, like the Lafalettes La and others are outnumbered. Some migrate to the uh, Populist Party. Others migrate to the Socialist Party. Um, the agenda of the uh, Republican majority is very pro-business. Um, increased tariffs. Uh, Ford and McCumber is a big one, 1922. And then uh, the period uh, ends with the um, uh, Hawley Smoot, which is another uh, tariff. Uh, they don't work. The tariffs don't work um, because other countries then pass retaliatory tariffs. And then, uh, yeah, if you could just be the only one in the world with tariffs, it'd be great. Uh, but it doesn't work that way. Uh, and the 1920s is really the time period where uh, Republican and Dem I mean, Democrats and Republicans. Democrats had always been against tariffs, um, but Republicans realized that tariffs don't work, um, and that's pretty much uh, the gospel, uh, economic gospel, up until about you know three years ago. Um, but they don't, they, they, but they still don't work. Uh, it's just that they're back in fashion. Um, corporate tax cuts, uh, along with the progressive income tax, is the first corporate tax that doesn't last long before it starts getting um, uh, uh, pushed back. Uh, again, anti-union sentiment. This is the era of what was known as the open shop. Um, open shop versus closed shop. Closed shop means in order to work in an industry, you have to belong to a specific union. Um, that gives the uh, workers in that industry what's called collective bargaining power. They can all get together and say, we want a raise. We want X amount of dollars. We want shorter working hours. And they have far more power negotiating because uh, to the person, uh, they're all in the same union. And if they don't get what they want, they can go on strike. And that is a, a way of leveling the playing field against the manufacturer. Well, the open shop is the opposite. The open shop is you don't have to belong to the union. So anyone who wants to get a job can, quote unquote, negotiate their own contract. Sounds really nice and good. Very free. Good for you. Good luck getting a raise. Good luck getting shorter hours. Not going to happen. Um, because one person doesn't have the negotiating power of thousands. Um, um, it is increased productivity. Things More and more things are being made. 
uh, but people aren't making as much. And ultimately, this is, as I'll uh, point out in the next lecture, um, one of the major problems of this era that leads to the major crash in 29 is that just um, a lot of Americans don't have enough spending power, spending power, um, purchasing power. Um, and that's ultimately not good for the economy. I'll explain why uh, in the next lecture. Um, and this is, again, the era of Taylorism. Uh, people, uh, um, Frederick Taylor, studying the motions, the movements, timing how workers work and uh, describing the best way to do it. Uh, for a lot of uh, industrial workers, this feels almost like they have become part of the machine, right? They don't even have the ability to um, uh, have any say over how they do their jobs. It's very dictated. Um, again, it's a good eight years uh, for some people. Uh, average standard of living increases, but also um, uh, inequality and unequal distribution of wealth also uh, increases. Um, how does that work? Obviously, it's a standard of living is a standard. So if the top end is going up dramatically, um, you can have more people on the lower end of the spectrum and the middle um, as long as the top end is going up more. Um, uh, so that is this time period. We're talking about the period, if you look here, right, you have net personal wealth, right, so this is the top 1%. This is the time where it's, you know, quite high, 1920s, and then you have the crash here. Uh, it goes up a little bit, and then it goes down, 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 because this is an era of increasing regulation and taxation, um, and the corresponding uh, um, uh, blue line here is net personal wealth for the middle 40%. So from the time period, really beginning in the 19, they don't, they're not recording this number pre-1960, so we don't have the number here. Um, but there is an inverse relationship. Uh, in the 1980s on, we have an era of deregulation, so the top 1% make more and more, and then the median 40% uh, make less and less. Um, not good for the economy. Uh, I've always said that, and now, you know, with the current crisis, see how that uh, plays out. Um, Okay, so 40% of Americans live in poverty. Sorry, Siri was interrupting me here. Um, internationally, um, the Dawes Plan, uh, something that uh, I didn't talk a lot about in the last lecture. This is a plan to try to help prop up the European economy after uh, World War I. It's kind of like a human centipede of money flow where uh, the United States would uh, lend money to Germany, which would then invest it in its economy so we could pay back France so that France could pay back the United States for the um, uh, military equipment and financial resources that the United States lent France, and then so on and so on and so on. Um, it Again, if you wanted to ask a question of why that works, um, uh, you could. If you wanted to ask a question of why, you, why it doesn't work, you could also ask that question. Um, uh, um, this is like any time of dramatic income inequality. Uh, you get a rise of extreme ideologies, in this case fascism and socialism. Um, socialism wanting to give more power to workers and uh, the working class. Fascism wanting to give more power to um, uh, industry, industrial leaders, and have a very close relationship between uh, industry and uh, government. And this is, again, if you want to ask a question about that, ask a question about what that means. It'll be fine by me. Um, labor unions, open shop. Um, the previous period is one of labor rights, uh, uh, people who are pro-labor. That doesn't disappear. So this is a time period where the dominant discourse is anti-labor, anti-worker. Um, uh, but that doesn't mean that just the, the pro-worker and pro-labor discourse disappears. It just becomes, you know, the minority. 60-40 one generation, 40-60 the next. Um, that's how sometimes it works. Um, oops, sorry. I don't want to read an article here. Um, unions. Um, a lot of them oppose World War I. That doesn't help them in the post-World War I era. Right? They're seen as anti-American, um, selfish. Imagine that. Um, uh, wanting a living wage. Um, they continue to fight for uh, workers' rights, but they um, continue to be met by violence. Again, open shop policies diminish this. A little local history. Uh, Los Angeles was an open shop um, uh, um, town in the 1920s, largely supported by the LAPD, which broke up strikes at the behest of uh, industries. The industry could just call the police to break up a, a labor protest. Um, how's your First Amendment rights there? Um, but, you know, it's a different era. 
Uh, the climate shifts in the 1930s. The, the city becomes more pro-worker, pro-labor. Wages increase. Uh, unionization efforts increase. Um, so a lot of the businesses who don't want to pay living wages, um, uh, what do they do? Uh, they move to Orange County. Um, so this is where we have the shift from Orange County being a right orange county with oranges growing, um, largely based on agricultural labor. Uh, to a place of business. They were, you know, low regulation, um, uh, hands-off uh, uh, county, and that kind of sets the political tone for Orange County up until the, the present day. Okay, cities. Um, cities are a, a hotbed of uh, leftists. Uh, this is a continuation of earlier moments. Paul Robeson, uh, famous uh, African-American actor, singer, communist, um, very, very prominent in the 1920s. Uh, when we talk about communism in the 1920s, uh, we can't project back uh, what we know from the Cold War period. Yeah, Americans don't like communists, but it's more like they don't like foreigners and things like that. But it doesn't have the kind of um, Cold War anti-Soviet feel that anti-communism will have in the 1940s on. Um, so communism does spread. Um, and again, here, as I've just said, this is before the Cold War, and it's even before of Stalin. Um, so Stalin is another, the rise of Joseph Stalin um, is another reason why communism in the United States gets, you know, a, 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 a more maligned is because you have this terrible, right, dictator in charge of the Soviet Union. Um, this is a time period also of black nationalism. Uh, Marcus Garvey is a black nationalist. He starts these black star lines, which the, the thinking is they were going to... Um, um, uh, you know, people were going to go back to Africa, black nationalism, black power. Um, it ends up being a fairly fraudulent uh, exercise. Um, um, but Garvey will be important later when we talk about civil rights, because you'll see in the civil rights movement there is a strain that is black nationalist. That is to say, we don't want to be integrated into white society. We want to create our own um, communities, our own nation, whether it's in the United States or elsewhere. So Garvey becomes an important symbol in the 1960s. Um, a lot of the radicalism of uh, black nationalism is a response to the fact that it doesn't work, right? That, that, that asking nicely for civil rights doesn't work. Um, it didn't work in 1850, it didn't work in 1870, and it doesn't work in 1920. So you see a lot of the movements for civil rights become more militant, become more radical. Again, keep that in mind for when we look at the 1960s, same thing happens. Um, and same things happens in 2020, right? So, you know, people who criticize, say, Black Lives Matter for its, you know, radical politics, um, that radicalism is born out of a, uh, a um, frustration with the regular um, uh, avenues of political action being um, not very productive, right? So you get it, it, when, 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 what is the... Uh, John Kennedy quote, um, when, uh, when peaceful, when you make peaceful, re, uh, re, when, when peaceful chain, when peaceful revolution is impossible, a uh, violent revolution becomes inevitable. Well, I mean, that's, that, that is certainly history bears that out. Harlem Renaissance. This is, uh, obviously Harlem, New York, a center of black music, literature, philosophy, um, uh, um, uh, jazz, you name it. Um, Harlem, but also other cities, Chicago famously, um, you have, uh, this is the beginning of the Great Migration, um, uh, black Southerners fleeing uh, oppressive racism and Jim Crow laws in the South, moving to cities in the North, um, and bringing music with them, um, and uh, 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 oral history and tradition, so it's, you have these thriving black metropolises. And you have black Southerners mixing with black Northerners in a way that is very uh, generative in terms of artistic creation. Um, gender roles begin to change. Um, uh, women start wearing shorter skirts. That is to say, like you can see, like women are showing their knees, which is very risque, um, cutting their hair short. Uh, but gender roles are not just about women, right? Gender is something. It's not gender. It's not something that women have, and, and, and you know, men just don't. Or men are like, you know, quote unquote normal or some kind of sexist notion. Um, gender roles are things for both men and women. So while women are demanding a vote, they're demanding more money, they're living on their own, 
um, with um, uh, birth control, they're taking control of their own bodies. Those are all changing gender roles. Um, but masculinity is also changing. Um, this is a time period where what it meant to be a man traditionally was, you know, you were a farmer, you worked with your hands, you produced things agriculturally, um, you were independent, you did not, you were not reliant on a wage from another man. Uh, because if you're reliant on a wage from a man, it makes it, you, puts you in a subservient position, which given traditional gender roles was the role a woman was supposed to occupy. So men are kind of freaking out about the fact that, you know, they just sit at a desk all day and some other guy gives them a paycheck. Um, uh, and that is translated into various ways. Um, you see a rise in, in uh, uh, spectator sports, uh, baseball, football, things like that. So a lot of kind of masculinist uh, pastimes are ways to uh, reaffirm one's masculinity. Um, men's, uh, men's clubs and things where men can go and hang out with just the boys kind of stuff. So um, in terms of gender roles, we have shifting gender roles for both men and women. Um, sexuality also uh, in cities, gay men and gay women occupy very visible roles in public life, entertainers, writers, um, uh, actors, uh, performers. Um, in a lot of ways, the 1920s, and this is in Europe and the United States, the 1920s were far more progressive uh, with respect to gender and sexuality than um, really, I mean, obviously the war, uh, one of the main targets of the violence for the fascists was um, uh, uh, gay people, um, among many others, obviously, which we'll talk about in the next lecture. Um, but uh, the 1920s was far more progressive than really anything up until the 1960s. Um, uh, okay. This is also a time of fundamentalism. Outside of cities, people are more fundamentalist. Uh, fundamentalist Christianity uh, is on the rise, um, most famously or infamously with the Scopes Monkey Trial, William Jennings Bryan. He's back at it. Not running for president this time, but rather this is his um, swan song, as it were, uh, acting as um, uh, defense for Tennessee, uh, Tennessee who wanted to ban the teaching of evolution. Uh, Scopes is the teacher's name who wanted, was teaching it. Um, Scopes loses in the end. Um, prohibition is another uh, sign that the fundamentalism is alive and well. Um, it's really evangelical Republicans versus everyone else. Catholics want to drink. Irish want to drink. Immigrants want to drink. Working class whites want to drink. Um, it's just the evangelical Republicans. Well, they, they win the day. Um, what happens with uh, prohibition is that you do get a growth of organized crime. Um, Al Capone, seen here, famous Chicago uh, Italian mafia uh, leader. Um, and this is the case always, right? If, if you're an immigrant group and you are denied the, the uh, standard channels for economic improvement, you can't get a bank loan, you can't open a business, you, you can't get a job maybe even because um, of your ethnicity, you're going to find other ways to make money. Um, and that the Irish do it in the 1850s, the Italians do it uh, in, at the turn of the century, uh, Chinese immigrants do it in the 1880s, um, uh, uh, black migrants from the south who move north do it. Um, it's just you know, it's, it's like history plus econ 101. Um, if you don't have ways to make money in a standard uh, economy, you're going to find your own. That's what happens. Uh, nativism on the rise peaks in 1924 with the Johnson Reed Act. Um, it is the most severe immigration restrictions. Um, it sets uh, immigration levels at the levels of the 1890 census which is, if you look at, right, Johnson Reed is 1924. That's a good deal of time before 1924. Um, I'll show you why they pick 1890 in a second. Um, basically bans undesirables. Um, these are largely immigrants from south, uh, Southern Europe and uh, Eastern Europe. Um, uh, so Eastern Europe being just Eastern Europeans in general, but also mainly uh, who's being targeted are Jewish uh, uh, immigrants from Poland, Russia, elsewhere. Um, in a time of white nationalism, the Ku Klux Klan is on the rise. Um, they enforce the racist policies of the South everywhere in the country. Uh, they expand to the North and to the West. Uh, 1924 Long Beach is the largest KKK rally west of the Mississippi. Um, 1926 Detroit is also a comparable uh, size. So it's certainly not about heritage. It is definitely about hate. Um, it's about trying to put black Americans, um, quote unquote, in their place. 
Um, again, this is coinciding with the time period where black Southerners are migrating north, migrating west. Um, well, they're not the only ones. White Southerners are also migrating, and they're bringing their racist views with them, uh, and that's why we have this. Okay, so immigration quotas. So a Asia, right, Chinese exclusion, you know, done had been in effect since 1882. So China's out um, already. Japan, with the Gentleman's Agreement, they're out. Korea is just Japan at this point in time. Um, but the 1917, there's an act called the Asiatic Bard Zone, uh, Immigration Act 1917, which basically, basically from the Bosphorus in Turkey all the way to um, Micronesia, uh, you can't come to the United States. So everywhere in Asia, uh, no one can come. The one exception is the Philippines, um, because of course the Philippines is not Asia, it's the United States. Uh, after the United States invades the Philippines and um, colonizes it, uh, Filipinos do have free uh, uh, travel to the U.S. So I said those 1890 numbers, remember 1924 is the Johnson-Reed Act. So this is about the immigration, what it looks like, right? Red meaning North and Western Europe, blue meaning Southern and Eastern Europe. You see this huge shift right here in the 19, at the turn of the century, um, big, right? Majority here also, 1891 to 1900, huge majority even here. Um, why do they set it to the 1890 levels? because fewer, fewer Southern and Eastern European migrants came then. So they set it to this year so that they can, as you see, it's effective, push back the tide of immigration. And if we go back here, you see some of the numbers um, of people um, who can actually uh, migrate. Uh, very few from the Middle East, um, but the Middle Easterners were considered um, uh, white. Uh, New Zealand and Pacific Islands, the numbers are so low because it's, right, it is um, uh, largely uh, aboriginal, right, Maori people. They're not, they're not uh, limiting the travel of people who, of uh, white English-speaking um, Kiwis. It's um, uh, Maori natives. Um, and you see, obviously, the big numbers, Irish, Great Britain, Germany, Denmark, Switzerland. Um, there is a, a quote from the president about the, you know, in a year or so or two years ago, the current president made about uh, uh, immigrants from some countries and other countries. I will not repeat it here, um, but basically these are the good ones. Uh, in terms of 1924, these are the good ones where the white people are from, um, and these are the ones that um, are the not so good ones, right? Um, Africa, other than Egypt, 1,000 total in the whole continent, right? Again, Egyptians and Middle Easterners being considered on some level, uh, depending on how much money you had, um, potentially white. Um, okay, last slide here, uh, just to go out here on a bang. Uh, this is a fundamental a time of real changes in uh, popular iconography. Um, popular culture really starts to emerge in this time period. Um, you know, in the 1880s, uh, you would have maybe put a picture of George Washington up on your wall, or Abraham Lincoln, or maybe this bizarre one of them embracing in heaven. Um, uh, not by 1920. By 1920, you want the silent movie stars, you want the actors and actresses. Um, this is the beginning of uh, where we very much are now, um, where you know no one wants to, no one cares about uh, some. Well, I guess maybe it's changing now. You have young, you know, young energetic politicians. People care again uh, about politics. Um, it's not just the Kardashians or some kind of thing. Um, but anyway, we're at the other other end of that uh, this story. Uh, this begins it, and we are at the moment where it you know ends. And it sounds ominous, but you know who knows. Uh, okay, that's it.